The title of uh, this evening's lecture concerns deep learning, which sounds uh, very sort of ominous and uh, portentous. And indeed, as we shall see in this lecture, the, ti the title Deep Learning was designed to sound portentous and ominous for very good reasons. Uh, this, my name is Richard Harvey. I'm the uh, IT professor here at uh, Gresham College. I'm sponsored by the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists, who are one of the livery companies of London, whose mission have a multi-headed mission to do good works, but one of their one of their missions is to educate people about the benefits of IT. So that's what we're doing this evening. I'm also a professor of computer science at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, where I study artificial intelligence. Right, first question for the physical audience. Please raise your hand if you know something about deep learning. Wow, more than I was expecting. I was going to make my joke, because no one would raise their hand, and I said, well, that makes, that makes all of us then. Um, <laughs> Uh, that there's a point to that joke, which I will, which I will pick up at the end of this, uh, this lecture. So uh, this lecture is actually going to be about um, some of artificial intelligence, and it's going to be about that part of artificial intelligence which converts numbers into classes. So we often call that pattern recognition. And um, if you want the sort of uh, two-minute lecture... I'm going to say that the current state of technology is pretty much that if you can cast your problem as getting from a set of numbers to a set of classes, classes being rough descriptors of things, then that problem can be solved pretty effectively using current technology in deep learning. So if your job is to, for example, look at chickens and decide what sex they are, uh, there are such people out there, they're called chicken sexes, then uh, I wouldn't hang around in that job for very long because that's the sort of job that can be automated. So there are quite a few jobs like that. Um, so if your job is to make investment decisions or um, if you are making insurance premiums or if you're essentially looking at data or images and making decisions or classifying things, my view would be you should change job. However, if your job is about interacting or persuading other intelligences or drawing sort of complex inferences from things, I'm hoping that our jobs are safe for a while. Okay, now you might not feel that at the end of this lecture, but that's, that's, my, um, that's my considered opinion on the basis of what I'm going to tell you this evening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fairly swiftly go through some of the ways these things work and as usual, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the basics, because if you can't understand the basics, you're not really in the debate, I think. Um, and then uh, we're going to just riff on a couple of um, issues with deep learning. And if you want the really short version of the lecture, yes, deep learning is something of a miracle and the results are very impressive, but there are issues. And I'm not going to go as far as saying there is snake oil about but there are issues, and we are, uh, by the end of this lecture, we will have certainly enumerated some of these issues. So this is a sort of Richard's potted history of artificial intelligence, done very, very swiftly, and I've split the last century and this century into decades down here, and I've just picked some systems that were sort of interesting as they uh, popped up in the, uh, in, in the scheme of things. In this lecture, I'm going to be mostly concerned with neural systems, systems that are inspired by brains. Um, now, as you say that, um, everyone who knows about artificial neural networks sort of has a shiver down their spine and uh, feels rather nervous. You know, they're not brains. Well, we know they're not brains, but they were inspired by brains, and they're, they're a class of systems that are either called neural or they're known as connectionist systems. And I'm going to look at these systems here because they, they make an interesting chain of discovery and it makes for a better story. Uh, what's Interesting sociologically is that if I was to plot excitement with artificial intelligence in my nice pink line here, uh, it sort of started at sort of fever pitch perhaps in the 1950s and then descended rather rapidly as uh, reality hit. And uh, then we had another sort of peak here and another descent. And I'm going to take you from the, the peaks of excitement here, ladies and gentlemen, down into the valleys of despair down here. And then we're currently here. We're on the sunlit uplands of, of um, uh, unrealistic expectations again. Okay, so um, 
And let's just start with one of these. I'm going to get into the theory in a moment, but let's just have a little bit of fun, I suppose, by thinking about this particular period here. And uh, this period here was sort of punctured by um, two people, or two things, really. I mean, one was the um, ALPAC report from in the USA, which essentially said the US government has spent an awful lot of money on speech recognition. We've had 20 years on this, and it's not really working, and let's not do it anymore. And then that Brit got on this bandwagon slightly later, as we usually do in so many things. And uh, we commissioned uh, Sir James Lighthill, who was a, a, an FRS and Lucasian professor of mathematics and terribly distinguished, to write a, uh, a sort of report about artificial intelligence. He divided artificial intelligence rather speciously, in my view, into three things. One was system A systems, advanced automation, he called them. And those were sort of engineers making control systems better and all that sort of stuff. Then there were uh, category C systems. They were uh, computers used to model brains and central nervous systems. And A, A and C, they were all right, uh, he said, because they were science. And then there was the dreaded category B systems. Category B systems were general intelligence. And he took again um, uh, general intelligence systems and... Um, because it's available to us, um, we can see him doing it, actually. The BBC broadcast, uh, I think it was an hour-long debate on a BBC series called Controversy, uh, where they invited Lighthill to, to debate the, the case for and against, uh, well, against artificial intelligence. And um, this is him doing it. OK, so it took I've place. I've been talking about computers and their benefits to us in a lot of fields, but I must come to the other side of the case. Computers have been oversold. Understandably enough, as they are very big business indeed. It's common knowledge that some firms bought computers in the expectation of benefits which failed to materialize. My concern tonight, however, is with the overselling of the longer term future of computers. The scientific community has a heavy responsibility to put forward its carefully considered view of the facts to avoid the public being seriously misled. Just as the US National Academy of Sciences did in 1966 when it reported that enormous sums of money had been spent on the aim of language translation by computer with very little useful result, a conclusion not subsequently shaken. Failures continually occurred also in computer recognition of human speech or handwritten letters and in automatic proving of theorems in higher mathematics. Well, there's Sir James uh, telling us that failures continually occurred in the computer recognition of human speech. And here is an automatic transcription of his criticism performed for me on the internet last week uh, by Trint.com for no money at all. So, it, for those of us who work in AI, there is a deep irony here. Uh, I suppose if I was to take Lighthill's uh, position, I would say no one at the time thought it would take 46 years to solve the problem of speech recognition. And as we saw in previous lectures, when I provided for you real-time speech recognition of my speech, uh, it is still far from perfect. Um, but it was a pretty serious and damning uh, attack on um, on British work in artificial intelligence, and uh, Britain essentially stopped working in this uh, area, and the USA happened to have a bit of a problem at the same time, and we entered a period that has become known as the artificial intelligence winter, uh, where very little work was done in the UK and the US. Japanese invested heavily in the, in, um, the fifth generation program at the time, and uh, if you worry about such things, uh, Britain lost a bit of uh, a lead in, in AI. After all, uh, while we did all sorts of other things which are presumably very important. Um, one of the recurring themes in science, of course, is that um, effective investment in this sort of technology is very expensive. And if you have a pot of money that is fixed, and you, for example, are a scientist who is used to receiving a large amount of money for, say, uh, well, Lighthill was a fluid dynamicist, so let's say mathematics and physics, you are quite considerably alarmed when you see a big 
uh, project like this on the horizon because it's going to eat all your sandwiches. Um, so it's not clear to me what Lighthill's motivations were, whether they pure, whether they're pure or not, but they certainly had some pretty damning uh, effects in AI. Uh, needless to say, uh, academics being academics, uh, some people ignored this work and uh, cracked on, and uh, well, that's what I want to talk about now. I want to talk about a type of machine learning called classification, and I'm going to really talk about supervised um, learning. And supervised learning is by no means the whole of AI. I mean, if I was to sort of draw a Venn diagram of AI, classification, which I'm going to talk about, is a small part in there, and the deep learning part of that is a small little overlap with that. But it, it allows us to construct a nice little uh, history and a story, and it's easier to understand, I think. So the, the system I'm going to consider here, just conceptually, is something where we've got some numbers on, sort of on the left of this diagram and we've got some classes on the right of this diagram. So let's consider a classifier working on, say, images. And this is a, an image I took from my last lecture on computer vision. So let's say we had a, a, an image here. And in the old days, people like me would, would labour long and hard to extract some numbers that might represent this image. We didn't want to work with all the pixels. We would work with some summary data. So maybe we would... Uh, say, we'll build a skin detector and we'll measure how many skin blobs there are in this image. And then maybe we'll measure, I'm making these up, you know, maybe we'll measure how much of the image is skin. And maybe we'll measure what percentage of the image is face. So, and we could go on. But typically these might have tens, hundreds, thousands even of, of features. And these numbers, of course, can be represented geometrically um, in this space over here, which we would conventionally call a feature space. So you then get a nice collection of data and you extract these uh, features. And I'm sort of plotting them symbolically over here. You can see I've got one set of classes on the top here, which is faces. I've got another class here, which is sort of cartoon pictures. I've got one instance here of, of what you might call crowds, and these seem to be chimpanzees, okay? So these are the chimpanzees, these are the faces, this is the crowds, and this is the cartoon imagery. I, I made all these numbers up. One thing to be, which I hope you can spot already, is that the classes are human decided. You know, I decided what was important in this problem. Um, so I can just push that a little bit further. The problem we are interested in is taking this set of numbers here, and I'm going to call that the training data, and I'm going to call these the classes, and then along comes the data that we haven't seen before, that's very important, and then the machine is going to tell us what it thinks the class is, what colour it is. Everyone happy with that? That is great, that's brilliant. If you, can, if you understood that, you understand supervised machine learning. Come and, come and take a professorship in machine learning, you pretty much know everything I know already. Right, so now let's switch to the neural people. So the neural people took their inspiration from um, sort of primitive diagrams of the, um, the, 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 the human brain. And this is indeed a primitive diagram taken from Wikipedia of um, one of the uh, sort of neural components. Uh, so this is the sort of fundamental uh, neuron. Uh, and the basic idea is that over on here, over on this side, we have inputs in here, these inputs are all sort of weighted together and considered, and then a signal travels out down here and goes to these outputs, which they themselves are then connected into millions and millions of other things like that. And that's the basic architecture of the human brain. And uh, this is a sort of model for that. I've got some inputs here, they get added together, they go through some function here, which is going to be some sort of nonlinearity, and we get an output here. So this is a, uh, just let me click through these. This is quite a uh, well-known model. It was one of the early uh, models of the human brain called a perceptron. Um, and some people called McCulloch and Pitts uh, developed, uh, developed this model. And just a, one little observation, I've now specified this box here as being what we would call in engineering a hard clipper. So it's a device It's a device that outputs not all one. So it's a sort of camel's back type device. Um, 
you flip from one state to the other state depending on whether these inputs here reach a threshold. Now I've added one component that wasn't there in my early diagram, which was these weights here. So the idea is that the output of this depends upon these weights. This is fixed, this is fixed. So if I just adjust these weights, I will get different outputs. So when this model got um, you know, introduced, there was quite a lot of excitement and people realized this was a sort of very likely to be, you know, very, so it was quite simple. It can be understood by everyone. And there was quite a lot of uh, interest and excitement about it, uh, enough that a guy called Frank Rosenblatt built one. And this is Frank Rosenblatt's uh, perceptron. It used to be kept somewhere in the basement of one of the Smithsonian uh, buildings. It seems to have disappeared. I can't find anyone who, at the Smithsonian who tells me where it is. But if there are any history of technology scholars in the audience, it would be fun to, to know about it. This is the input over here, I think. It, this was connected to a very primitive camera, um, which had... Um, well, you'll laugh, really, when I say this. Your, your iPhone camera has thousands of thousands, thousands by thousands of pixels, you know, millions of pixels. This had 20 by 20 pixels, so it's quite low resolution. Uh, and I think this is a plug panel that allows you to plug various bits together. And then this, these are the weights. And the weights Rosenblatt implemented with motorized potentiometers. Okay, so the idea is you sort of, you tweak all these weights and then you add them up here and you look at this, I, I presume, you look at this little meter here and you say, oh yes, 15, great. Uh, and th this I expect is all the power supply. That would be my, that would be my guess as to how this works. Okay, wonderful bit of, uh, you know, the, what's the word? Um, Old-fashioned engineering. And Rosenbach went further. He said he developed an algorithm that allowed to train this thing. I'm going to go through this fairly pronto because the, the principles of the perceptron algorithm or the perceptron rule are quite simple, actually. Um, I want to just pick out a couple. The basic idea is this. We're going to find some training data. Well, we know that because that was on the previous slide. We're going to find some training data and some classes. And then we're going to set the uh, weights to random values. That's the starting point. We're going to then run that thing and see how well it does. And then everything it gets wrong, we're going to use that to adjust the weights. So that's the, that's the idea. And we keep doing that until it gets it right. Because quite a lot of this in machine learning Basically, you beat uh, computers until they get the right answer, you know, just like small children. And so the perceptron rule is a bit like that. Um, uh, so here's how it sort of works in, in a, toy, a little toy example. I've got a two-class problem. Perceptrons only have a zero, a minus one, or plus one output, so they can only cope with one, uh, uh, only cope with two classes. Um, and you can see this one is plus. You can't see this one is plus, but I'm telling you it's plus, and this one is minus. And then we're going to make some sort of random guess for the weight vector, uh, which I have done. And it's quite easy to work out that the uh, weight uh, vector and those combinations forms a straight line in my feature space. So in this case, that is the straight line that's defined with my random choice of uh, vectors. And the straight line has a sign to it. So this classifier says anything on this side I am going to call plus class and everything on this side I'm going to call minus class. So it's called a binary classifier because it classifies things into two different things. So we'll run that over some test data. That was the test data I looked at earlier. The first point, which was here, it got that wrong. Got the second point. Uh, right, woohoo, and it got the set point wrong. So what I'm going to do in the perceptron rule is I'm going to look at this point specifically. Uh, let's just speed on and do that. Um, so the way the perceptron rule does is it says, well, I'm going to take the wrong thing. I'm going to add a bit of that to the weight vector. And um, because I'm moving a bit quickly, it's probably a bit easier to think of this geometrically. So let's have a look at that. We're going to take this thing and yank it towards the thing that is wrong, okay? Ooh, like that. Okay, so the effect of that is to produce a new classifier. So we then go and try that new classifier on all of our data. And now we've got the first point right. That's good, because I've just adjusted that to be right. But oh dear, we've got the second point wrong, and we've got the third point right. And, and then we, get, we, we carry on doing this in a very sort of nauseating and sort of, you know, computery way. And after a little bit of faffing around, 
Um, yes, eventually I get them all right and I stop. Hurrah, I have now solved this very, very simple toy classification problem. And that was what Rosenblatt did with his, you know, his, his wonderful potentiometers. So the guy was sort of sitting there, you could hear this sort of whirring noise as all these weights were being adjusted. And I'm going to come back to that analogy later on. It's still uh, highly relevant to the way uh, today's systems work. Well, uh, this was all very good, you know, and there was, uh, this was, if I remember rightly, this was funded by the, uh, actually, I probably don't remember right, I don't think it was civil funding. I'm fairly sure this was funded by the US uh, military, and Rosenblatt certainly went on record making some pretty uh, exciting claims for the perceptron, and I'll just pick out um, one. You can easily show that this can model logical ands and ors. Uh, and not, actually. So that's great. That means you can model all of logic, doesn't it? So that's a fantastic sort of discovery. It means that the unit of operation in your virtual brain is able to completely model all logical thinking that you could possibly think of. That is... that You can imagine that there was some excitement at this, um, at this point. And then it all got deflated. And uh, the deflation happened probably with this book, Perceptrons, written by Marvin Minsky and Samuel Pappert. In the pa I put the, pat put the front cover on the front one because it's a bit of an eye teaser. But um, they, they gave it an example. That, I don't know if you can spot this, but if you track these round, you can see that there are actually two things here intertwined. This is an example of a pattern classification problem that simply cannot be solved with perceptrons. Uh, there was a more famous um, example that couldn't be solved. I mean, what Minsky and Pappert showed in their book was that the XOR, which is another type of logical function, also couldn't easily be, well, couldn't be modelled by a perceptron. Now, looking back on it, it's very difficult to sort of really describe why this killed research in neural networks quite so comprehensively. Um, you know, they were still quite interesting, but the, the fact is, it, it, love died, you know, and um, I think what had happened was that Rosenblatt had really sort of built up the expectations about these things, so it was very easy to puncture the balloon, and all the romance sort of disappeared, and we realised our oh, perceptrons aren't good enough, they can't do things. Um, in practice, they also have a whole stack of issues which are annoying, you know, there are some convergence issues. I don't know if you noticed, but the line it drew between the classes wouldn't be the line that you or I would draw between the classes, it was sort of dangerously close to one of the points so it had what we would call now a small margin. Uh, the outputs are not very easy to interpret, you know, plus or minus one isn't a probability, um, and so on and so on. So there, there was sort of a whole range of issues that was that was sort of um, sort of disturbing. And it killed AI for a bit. You know, it certainly killed that bit of AI. Um, that said, you know, um, as usual, there were a few sort of souls who carried on uh, working on this. A problem, and it really led to Perceptron version 2. And Perceptron version 2 has this thing in it. It doesn't have this hard limiter in it. It has this smooth curve here. It's called a sigmoid function, usually, or a softmax or something like that. And this is really neat, and it's really helpful because it forms the basis for a lot of developments in the next uh, sort of two chapters of AI. And the reason it's helpful is this, because I don't know if you noticed, but in order to train the old version, what I was doing was I was looking at this pattern and comparing it to the supervised answer. Right? So that's error. Right? I was looking at the error and the outputs, and I was using that to make adjustments. So you can see that with the softmax, this is quite easy to do. When I've got a big error, then I could adjust these weights in a way that made some sort of sense. You imagine doing that yourself. So let's imagine you've got this thing here. It hasn't got the right class. So you've got this output here that you don't think is quite the right output. And you've got these sort of knobs, which are all of these weights. Could you imagine sort of altering the knob a bit? So you sort of oh, uh, oh, it's getting better, better, better. Oh, it's getting good, good, better. That's, so what you're measuring there is the gradient of adjustment, if you like. It's how quickly 
does this change as I change this? Right? And this softmax function, the sigmoid, allows that to happen. When it was uh, clipped, you could adjust this all you like and nothing happened, nothing happened, and then suddenly, bang, it changed. It's like a thermostat, you know. You know I've, I've spent the last few days in hotel rooms and I'm tediously familiar with the operation of a thermostat. You know, get it, oh, come on, get it hot, oh, my God, it's hot, you know. Uh, turn it down, oh, I'm freezing, you know. So this, is, uh, this continuum helps a lot. So this is how, um, and this is a useful mental model to have. You know, imagine yourself a little sort of gremlin adjusting these knobs and seeing how much this thing changes. Now, the reason that mental model is helpful is because what we're going to have to do is the inverse. We're going to have to work out what these should be given this. So if I know the forward change, the rate at which this change is given that, then I can invert that and convert changing this into that. And if I can do that, and I can do it in one of these, then I can do it in a whole load of these things all nested up quite nicely. So now I'm just going to not draw the nonlinearities, and I'm not going to draw the weights. The weights are going to be implicit. If you see an arrow, then it's, it means you take this signal here, you multiply it by something, you sum it, and output the nonlinearity. So this is a standard uh, signal graph that's used in, in signal processing, where arrows mean essentially multiplication by a constant. And we can layer these things up. Uh, so instead of just restricting ourselves to maybe one output, uh, we could have two or, or three, or we could have layers of these things. And this is the sort of, uh, this is the sort of arrangement that became known as an artificial neural network, or ANN. So there are lots of issues with this, which we haven't really got time to dwell upon, but um, this is, this, you put the inputs in here, they're sometimes called a retina, uh, and these are the outputs, these are the things that are going to indicate the classes. There's lots of uh, earnest papers written about ways to code classes into the outputs. The obvious one is perhaps, you know, this is going to be the fish detector, this is going to be the, the animal detector, this is going to be this detector, and so on and so on, but there are, there are others. The innovation, really, was the way of training these things, um, because it hadn't been clear how to train them. And um, the Innovation was an algorithm called backpropagation. And what backpropagation allows us to do is to measure the errors here and share a little bit of the error back down this network here. And the reason that works is because of the knob twiddling analogy. OK, so um, these can model uh, those uh, difficult logical functions like XOR. That's great. And instead of having straight decision boundaries as we had previously, they have curved ones, so they've got lots more uh, representative power. That's great. And they're trainable via backpropagation, which is often called backprop in the, tr in the trade. Backprop was a real sort of light bulb moment, really, really uh, important. And I was a graduate student when these uh, were sort of being uh, played with. I remember coming to the first Artificial Neural Networks conference in, in London in, uh, the, uh, in what was then the Institution of Electrical Engineers in Savoy Place. I was so excited that I paid for it myself. Um, and I can't remember where we stayed, but it certainly wasn't a very salubrious... It was a, you know, I think we stayed in some red light district as it was then, you know. It's probably now a set of yuppie flats. But, you know, it was, it was pretty exciting and Tuvo Cottenham was there and all of the great... And this was... This, we, we were building the first artificial brains and it was really uh, the beginning of something really, really important. Uh, well, we sort of fell out of love with artificial neural networks. And some of the problems were listed here. The first one, this did get solved in the end, but the first one was that it wasn't e immediately easy to work out what these outputs meant. So it said, look, there is an incoming torpedo coming towards you. And so this is a torpedo classifier problem. And you say, oh, well, how, how, how likely is this? And it says a thousand. And you say, a thousand what? You know, a thousand times more likely than this or that? And it said, well, just a thousand. I'm a neural network. I don't calibrate things in anything meaningful. You know, so that was an issue. That got solved with a guy called um, Chris Bishop and others who showed how you could train these things to have probabilistic outputs. 
but uh, that was, it was quite late on that that got um, solved. And they, the, the simple fact was that economics started to kick in, really. Um, the, what, what happened? I suppose the simple fact was that there were just better, it was better performance available elsewhere. So if I had the choice between an artificial neural network, which had all of these funny weights, and I didn't really know what it was doing, it was a bit of a black box classifier, or, say, a support vector machine or something which had firm theoretical foundations, I chose the other thing. You know, and I really fell out of love with artificial neural nets. Well, to be fair, I don't think I was ever really in love with them, but you know, they, were, they were rather problematic. And another, we had another sort of artificial intelligence winter, really, which only affected uh, neural networks, but it was a pretty serious one. And um, a number of people have estimated that the sort of number of people working in artificial neural networks shrank from maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, down to a handful of people. You know, sort of heroes working away on problems to do with artificial neural networks. And there were people like Jeff Hinton, who um, is an uh, Englishman but is based in the University of Toronto. Um, Jan Lacoon, who was his uh, graduate student. Lacoon was um, made famous in the, in the third wave of neural networks, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And, uh, well, Steve Luttrell, who was um, based at the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment. I remember going to visit Steve, actually, in the late 80s, and he, I think it was the late 80s, he showed me this thing which we now know is called an auto-associative uh, coder. Very, very trendy and popular auto-associative coders. And I remember saying to him, I said, Steve, why are you working in artificial neural networks? Nobody funds that stuff anymore. Now, of course, he was funded by the government, so he wasn't worried about those sort of things. But, you know, it, it really was... It was about as trendy as flared trousers and platform heels. You know, you really didn't want to work in ANNs. Now then, what changed? And there was a very practical issue. The practical issue was that it, these, as we tried to make deep networks like this with lots of layers, they became impossible to train. And what seemed to be going on was two things. The first one was there are now thousands of these weights that we have to adjust. So the, just the scale of the training was really daunting in the 90s. We just didn't have computers that were good enough to do this. And I'll talk about this in a moment. You know, it's a really serious uh, issue. Um, and then there was a technical issue, which is these gradients which we're relying on to do this training often went to zero or infinity. Um, and that means the training just failed. So you'd sort of... You can imagine, um, again, to talk a little bit about sociology, I mean, most, a lot of work in science is done by graduate students who are with you for three or four years. You know, that's the length of time. So if you set them a project that cannot be done in three or four years, you're not a very popular supervisor. You know, um, and by the way, most universities are heavily punished if graduate students do not complete on time. So there's enormous societal pressure to reduce the amount of work that's done for PhDs. So you can imagine if you said to your PhD student, look, I want you to work on this thing which is going to take years to train. You are not a popular person at all. So there's another reason why these things sort of uh, really weren't popular. However, this is uh, the first system that meets the criteria of the lecture, which is it is a deep network. This is an example of a network that has a bottleneck in it. This is a bottleneck here. These, again, are the inputs. These are the outputs. This is a peculiar network known as an auto-associative uh, um, encoder, actually. And the idea, this type of network, is usually trained by putting inputs in here and asking that the outputs match the inputs. That seems a bit weird. Why would we do that? Normally, there are classes, aren't there, over here? Why would we do that? Well, the answer is that in this bottleneck, you hope the network will develop some sort of internalised, efficient representation of the pattern. So if you think back to the, my first lecture, where I talked about the, the challenge of coding and find the informationally theoretical constructs that represent all the information, these are often used in coding. So I've used these in, um, in problems that we work on. I work in the problem of lip-reading people, and these bottlenecks are very useful for uh, extracting out information that we think is useful from the information that is non-informational. 
Uh, but the, this is a symbolic one. I mean, this is just one I drew. I have to say, it took me a long time to draw it, so I'm sitting up here for a quite a while while I revel in my artistry at PowerPoint. But let me show you a real one. Oh, my God, and it looks almost repulsive, doesn't it? I mean, it's... So um, this is uh, a MATLAB visualisation of a real uh, neural network. This is Google Net, which is a, uh, a system for... Um, classifying images and I wanted to show it to you for several reasons one is it's fiendishly complicated okay the word deep has no good technical meaning by the way it just means there's a lot of this in this direction okay there's a lot of this because it's trying to model a lot broadly speaking the front part of this network will be modeling generic things to do with the object classes and over here will be to do specific things to do with object classes. And that's one of the beauties of these deep learning systems, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Furthermore, in this one, each one of these little eight-point fonts is itself a neural network. Okay, So these are really quite big uh, systems. There's about a billion multiply additions as you run through this thing forwards. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a system called GoogleNet. It's actually written like this in uh, honour of Jan LeCun, who, was one of the, uh, who worked on a, one of the first deep learning systems. Uh, Jan, um, I forgot, uh, Jan once told me how you pronounce his name, and it isn't LeCun, it's LeCun, I think. Um, uh, he's a funny, interesting man, uh, Jan. Um, very, you know, one of Jeff Hinton's students, and he worked on handwriting recognition. Um, but Google Net is named in Google, Google Net is named in honour of him. Um, let me give you some sort of stats so you can see how these things work. This particular exists. Google Net was uh, an object recognition system. Dates from about uh, 2014, so it's not quite of the moment, but it, it's, it's still pretty good. Um, it has a thousand uh, classes and it took 1.2 million images to train it. For those of you who are not sure what a thousand classes look like, uh, this is a thousand classes, okay, and for those of you who are not blessed with the visual acuity of an eagle, let me just give you an example. So up here, black swan, over here, dishwasher, over here, bulletproof vest, you can tell it's an American thing, can't you, uh, and over here, Oxygen mask. You know. So these are a thousand objects um, selected. Uh, uh, they found images of all of these things and then they trained the network on all of those things. Great. Okay. Um, it has 22 layers deep and on my laptop when I ran this a couple of days ago it ran in about a quarter of a second. And the paper for Google Net doesn't actually tell you how long it took them to train, though. And um, people are a, a bit coy about how long it takes to train these systems. Um, and the, the reason, of course, is um, scientists are always very guarded about how long it takes to train things. And that's because there's all sorts of tweaking that goes on in the training. So the obvious question is, well, how long did it take to train that configuration which we're looking at right now, to which you might get an answer, you know, which might be, in this case, I would have thought several weeks uh, to train that. Then you need to ask, and which supercomputer did you use to train it? So this is Google, uh, who bought the company DeepMind, who are responsible for a lot of these innovations. And you may get an answer to that if, if they know, because remember, these things are distributed, so they run across multiple processes, so people aren't super clear about how long these things take to try. And then, of course, there's the question, and how many architectures did you try uh, before you picked this one? This is, you know, the one that in the paper, of course, is always the best one, isn't it? Nobody publishes their worst algorithm. They always publish the best algorithm. So that's another question which isn't really answered. Um, I was looking at a system recently where they were a bit more candid about this, and they had been training this particular network for six months on, I think it was a thousand, uh, thousand node super, supercomputer. So they are, it's fair to say that there are fairly significant uh, resource implications in training these, these things, notwithstanding the, you know, the brilliance of the algorithms that are used. Well, th what this system does then 
is it takes, uh, it takes an image as input over here. Whoops, come back. Uh, it takes an image as input over here. It goes into this uh, deep learning thing, which I'm caricaturing as a black box. If you remember my first lecture, I talked a little bit about why black boxes are called black boxes. Um, it's a thing where specific, you just know the inputs and the outputs. And then it looks for its thousand labels, and hallelujah, this is very nice, it gives you a probability that it's each one of these labels. So the, the number one probability for this image, which is one of MATLAB, which is standard mathematical programming languages, standard test images, is bell peppers. Hurrah! It jolly well ought to be, and that's not a bad result. And then you can see lurking in a very, very... Uh, distant place, we've got some rather obscure things like candle, butternut squash, granny smith and cucumber. Now, this little test example is rather interesting because it illustrates some of the things that you uh, that are rather interesting about uh, deep learning. The first one is, it's quite common for people to say to me, why did it choose candle? You know, and you, you say, well, it didn't choose candle. Candle was extremely improbable, but it is a feature of uh, these systems, that when they get it wrong, they can get it badly wrong, and you're not really sure why. Um, and the issue there is this thing here, the black box. That no one is really super sure what the hell is going on in here. Now, what I mean is, of course, we understand the algorithm, but understanding the algorithm, which is, well, we just add up all these weights, uh, we just multiply by all these weights, add it up, do that 22 million times, and out comes the answer. That isn't really a scientific explanation of learning. Um, so this is a very, you know, sort of very interesting dilemma that we face at the moment. And the issue is perhaps even more um, acute, and I'll talk about that uh, talk about it slightly later. Let's look at the ultimate exposition of this so far, um, which is AlphaGo. AlphaGo was a system developed by Google to try and learn to play the game of Go. Go, for those of you who don't know, is a sort of really, really fancy chess, you know, um, uh, very popular in, in Asia using black and white stones. It, it, for those of you who are not Go players, it's completely incomprehensible, other than to say it's very complicated and difficult, and most people thought it couldn't be uh, really solved by computer. So they built a system to uh, have a go at Lee Sedol, who was the uh, top Go player at the time. Lee uh, thought that he would win 5-0 or 4-1 or against uh, the AlphaGo. He was pretty confident. He was the number one player, after all, at the time. And I'll just show you a clip that covers the second match, and it covers the 37th move. And the clip starts with Lee outside having a smoke uh, while he thinks about uh, what's going on. And while he's outside, the computer, AlphaGo, makes, makes the the 37th move. Just, just have a look at this. All right, so there's Lee having his contemplative smoke out, outdoors, and let's see what happens. Lee Zedal go to smoke, and Alva go just to play. I don't think about the, the open if it will be zero or not. So, Ajap sees Alva go plays the move 37, and I just put the stone in the board. Wow, oh. really, really oh. yeah. uh, uh, That's a very, that's Ooh. a very surprising move. I thought, I thought it was, I thought it was a mistake. When I see this move, for me, it's just a big shock. What? Normally, human, we never play this one because it's bad. It's just bad. We don't know why. It's bad. But it's a little bit high. Yeah. It's fifth line. Normally, you don't make a sort of hit on the fifth line. Um, so coming on top of a fourth line stone is really unusual. Yeah, that's an exciting move. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've seen an original move here. That's the kind of move uh, that, you, that you play go for. Hey. Interesting stuff. This fifth line shoulder hit is that. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Um, I don't really know if it's a good or bad move at this point. The professional commentators almost unanimously said that not a single human player would have chosen move 37 
So I actually had a poke around in AlphaGo to see what AlphaGo thought. And AlphaGo actually agreed with that assessment. AlphaGo said there was a one in 10,000 probability that move 37 would have been played by a human player. So it knew that this was an extremely unlikely move. It went beyond its human guide and it came up with something new and, and creative and different. I am very much watching the game through these commentators. That's the way it works. So when they're confused, I'm certainly confused. At the same time, I'm latching on to the fact that, that they are confused, right? That is, that is an interesting moment. When everyone else is confused, who's not confused, right? Besides the machine. I want to see Lise Dahl when he sees this move. He's back, Lee is back. He lost. <laughs> well, it was very, it was very exciting because Lee Sedol lost. Okay, I think he lost. Uh, he certainly lost that game, and he 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 took one game from the computer, and uh, did not take home the million dollar prize that was on on the table at the time. So this is peak excitement for uh, deep learning, and it sort of looks as though. Um, the situation we're in at the moment is really quite impressive. There are these systems that are able to essentially solve the classification problem, and there are a whole load of things that just are even more surprising that I haven't talked about. Let me just mention one of them. Um, the fact is that I was able to download and run uh, Google Net or AlexNet or those things in, I think it took me 15 minutes to do that. Um, it was a pre-trained network when it had been trained by someone else. Even better, these networks are not only available to everyone in this audience, but you can retrain them for your problem. So the early bits of the network, which split the problem into its basic components, they don't change very much as you add in new classes or you try and solve your problem. So I've done this. You know, we, we were looking for famous people, they didn't have the famous people we needed in the, the network we downloaded, so we just added some famous people, we retrained it, and whoa, we've got our own additional famous people. This is very, very powerful. But it does have, when you've got a very powerful technology that can be downloaded and used by essentially high school students, um, you, you can end up in a slightly weird position. Um, so here's one story. Um, the, a, a major, major computing manufacturer told me the other day that they were hiring artificial intelligence engineers in deep learning. This is a very good thing to be. You're going to be earning many hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're any good in this uh, field. Uh, salaries are sky high and people are very keen to do it. And they asked all of the contestants, of whom there were 40, they said, can you tell me the objective function that you were minimizing when you trained these networks? By the way, everyone in this audience already knows that. I didn't call it an objective function, but you know that you measure the error between the output and the input, and you optimize that, and you're trying to minimize the error. No one of the 40 knew what the network was doing mathematically. They knew how to download it, they knew how to use it, but they didn't really know how it worked. Now, this has some quite unfortunate consequences. Um, so I'm just going to pay you a quick video uh, showing uh, from Jace uh, Boulamwini, sorry, Joy Boulamwini, who is a PhD student at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Hi, camera. I've got a face. Can you see my face? No glasses face? What about my hair? But back to my face. You can see her face. What about my face? Well, I've got a mask. Can you see my mask? So this was dynamite in the USA. Uh, um, the, the idea being that a number of common face, detect face trackers simply don't track uh, African-American faces. They were never trained to do that, and no one thought to check. So 
In the USA, where race is a big, big issue, this is highly embarrassing, and the manufacturers who've done this are desperately, quickly trying to pretend that it was all an accident. Um, but this is going to be a big issue for deep learning. You know, how do you ensure that things are fair, fair and that you're not building a machine that is intrinsically racist or sexist or gendered or any of those things? So there's some early work on this by, um, I'll just call out one of them, the IBM Fairness Toolkit, for example, is a, a, a neat way to try and measure these uh, things. And there's also some work on trying to make sure that the learning you're doing is transparent and understandable by humans. That's a very interesting topic, this, is sort of the ethical, the interplay of deep learning with ethics. Uh, for those of you who are interested in it, we can't talk about it today because time is going to press on us. But I think uh, let me just um, big up a debate that's going on, uh, sponsored by the, worship, by the Worshipful Company of IT, uh, where we're going to be debating whether there is any uh, such thing as AI ethics and if there is what you do about it. Um, I am on one side of the debate. Um, and my opponent is Chris Rees, who is the president of the British Computer Society and the chair of the Ethics Committee of the British Computer Society. So I fear that I might lose because he seems, I've met him a few times and he seems very brainy. But um, if you're interested in those sorts of things, then you'd be very welcome uh, to do so. So far, I've been talking about systems that essentially take sets of numbers and output classes. But I haven't really talked about the thing that we use every day. I've been skipping around that, and there's a good reason for that, because it's a little bit more complicated. But that thing is text. And that's what I want to do in the next lecture. In the next lecture, I want to show how text drives the internet and how text and information theory combine to create the modern information age. Thank you.